Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good. Day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our back in our Father's Word, the book of Romans. Uh, we're in chapter 12, and I, I want you to remember that in chapter 12, verses 1 through 9 have to do with your personal getting along in society. And from 9 through uh, 20, 21, it has to do with... Um, with uh, with living socially in a community, and chapter 13 is how to live civilly with a government. So really your the ABCs of the gospel are very important right here, telling you how to be happy within yourself, how to be happy in your community, and how to be happy in your government, how, how, how you should act, interact, and react. So we had completed the first nine verses I want you to remember the last verse that we covered in that um, series from 1 through 9 telling you how to be happy in your own body. It said, let, let love be without uh, dissimulation, or let it be real. Don't, don't play. It's got to be real. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. If you want to be happy within yourself, that's your mark. Is leave the evil alone. You don't need to go there and stay with the, with the uh, good, and learn to love our Heavenly Father. For our Father is love, um, because He loves His children. Now we go into the society, getting along in a society. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 10, and we continue. That word of wisdom from our Father. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. That preferring, this word means really to, if, if you are gifted, lead out. <clears throat> Be a leader in the community. And, and um, th that means being in your kindness. Lead out with kindness uh, when it is accepted and when, when it improves. That's how you find happiness. And... Um, to get along with a brother and even a neighbor. You want, you want to know that a, a brother is one born of the womb of Israel and a neighbor is one that is adopted in through Christ, okay? That's a neighbor. Verse, um, then we go with verse 10, 11 rather, to continue. And it reads, not slothful, that means don't, don't be a little bit on the lazy side, in business. Uh, fervent in spirit and serving the Lord. If you want to be successful in, in business, be, be, um, be a leader in it. Example, uh, you must let that kindness come forth. Example, if you walk into a business and, and uh, somebody, if the owner or the person running it says, what do you want? Hey, turn around and walk out. Because if, if they don't give you service before you buy, you're sure not going to get service after you buy. You, you, don't, you don't need to go there. That person, that business is not going to be there long. It's not going to make it. But when you go into a business and they say, good day, how are you? What can I do for you? How can I help you? Now, now you're cooking, okay? That's... That's, then you're in a business that cares. They'll care for you most likely before you buy, and they will service you after you buy. So uh, this goes a long way in society in getting along. Uh, then, and with the next verse, please, uh, verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, Continuing instant in prayer. Uh, be be uh, patient when something goes wrong. 
That's, that, that's tribulation. If, if you get all excited and huffy and, and lose it uh, in tribulation, you're going to make a fool out of yourself. And, and um, I, I always like to use it this way. When tribulation comes along, let's say you're driving and you have just about had it, something almost hit, that's not a time to get shook up. You can, after it's all over, then you can shake and get shook up. But while it is happening, you be long-suffering. You keep your good conscience about you, and you take care of business, or you could die. Okay. So there is a time to maybe shake if you want to, but don't let it be while tribulation is there. That even goes for standing against the tribulation of the false one. Don't let him see you sweat on your first cruise, all right? You, you, you be patient in tribulation. Don't, don't, don't sweat it. It's going to be just fine. You can cut it. You can handle it. Why? Well, continuing instant in prayer, you ask his strength, his power, his will, that he is with you. What have you got to be afraid of? If God will never leave you and never forsake you, what in the world are you worried about? You can cut it, whatever comes up. You don't have to worry. Think, and think for yourself. You'll do just fine. Verse 13. Um, distributing to the necessities of saints, give to, give to hospitality. 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. And well, how, how can you do that? And you know, Christians... You get one of these bleeding heart Christians and they'll read that. Well, I've even got to be, I, I've got to wish a blessing on the enemy. Bless, you, that means you pray that he gets an attitude adjustment. You, you, you pray that God will straighten his case out. That's a blessing. You're blessing him with something he truly needs if, if he's a troublemaker. And... Um, Sometimes God might have to take a he two before to kind of get somebody's attention a little bit. Well, that's a blessing. When God thumps their gourd and they know it, they usually will straighten out, okay? That's a blessing. You don't have to curse them. That doesn't help. But ask God. He's a God of vengeance. Tell him to fix it. And pray that he fixes it. Verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Uh, be happy with somebody when they have something to be happy about. At the same time, if somebody has lost someone, then, then um, be patient with them. Be sorrowful with them that they have, have, have uh, lost something. And be strong with them, showing them the way, letting the love and kindness go forth. Uh, so there's a time for rejoicing and there's a time to weep. And a true Christian trained in God's word knows how to handle that, whereby it is effective and, and it is real. Like you said, let your love be real, none of this fake stuff. Verse 16, be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Now, this is something that's very difficult for, you know, when someone begins to study God's word and they begin to see the truth, don't let that puff you up. You, it, when you... When you are speaking to a person that is new, it isn't important that you dump a whole load on them and show them how intelligent you are, how God has blessed you. It's important that you give them what they need for that moment, whereby they can grow also. You know, many people, uh, let's take this ministry. Let's take the questions and answers. You know, we go into millions of homes, and at every broadcast, there are thousands of brand new listeners that have never heard God's Word taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse. So there are some tender ears, 
Plus, there are some out there that have studied with the chapel and with other people for many years. And sometimes they will say, well, why do you answer that same question over and over? Because you have to feed the little ones or you're going to miss out. You know, well, I, I just want the deep stuff. Well, then shove off. Go somewhere else. You're not needed. Okay. Why? Because you are conceited within your own self. And a self-righteous hypocrite will never be used of God. If you don't care about the little ones, that's to say somebody just coming into the truth, you're not truly a Christian. Because Christianity has time and patience with the little ones. This is why Christ would say to Peter one time, Peter, lovest me? And Peter said, well, Lord, you, you know I do. And he said, well, feed my sheep. And, and, and the, wait just a sec. Peter, lovest thou me? But Lord, why do you ask me again? Of course I love you. He says, feed my lambs. Now there's a difference between the sheep and the lamb. Okay. That's the little ones. You have to be patient and, be, and um, uh, condescend if you have to and you must. In other words, you go where they are and bring them up to you. Don't you dump on them and try to show them everything you know. It's not going to do any good. If anything, you might drive a new one away. Be patient. God, Christ's love is a fantastic thing. He's got time. He had time. Do you. Verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Your, your reputation, uh, you be well thought of by all men, that you, you're honest. You teach God's word honestly. You, you teach God's word as it's written, and you let God's love show through, and you be honorable and honest in teaching it and in living it and um, you, you, um, you provide things honest, you take thought beforehand what your situation is in the sight of all men. Because Why? Because some, some men know a lot, some men don't know much. They need help and the Christian should be able to ascertain that spiritually. That's called spiritual discernment. It's a gift from God. <clears throat> Use it. Uh, <clears throat> be patient of all things. 18. Listen carefully. Learn something. If it be possible, much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, First off, I want you to know, it is not possible to live peaceably with all men. There, there are people that you, you cannot get, get along with. And God does not expect you to be a walking mat for anyone. God expects you as a child of God to cut the path, to be in the wake of the Lord Jesus Christ, but um, you, you don't have to, if it's possible, get along. You know, you, if you're mature in Christ, you, you can see through and use a little wisdom from our Father and get along with most everybody. But there comes along sometimes somebody that you, I mean, it's impossible. So then don't, don't waste your time there. That's casting your pearls before swine. And... Um, Christians have a bad habit of this. They feel that, well, I must love everybody. You love Satan? I hope not. That, that'd be like trying to flirt around with a trip to hell if you're not careful. You love our Father and what he stands for and follow his advice and do it that way. If it's possible, get along. If it's not, then you can't. Don't, don't uh, waste yourself on a lost cause. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Do, do, do you know where that's written? It's written in Deuteronomy chapter 32, I believe it's verse 35. That's the song of Moses. That's the song that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 15, 
that all that overcome Antichrist, all that overcome the mark of the beast will be singing that song, that song of, of Moses written in Deuteronomy 32. And in that 35th verse, God makes it very clear, vengeance is mine. Well, what does that mean? It means God will take care of it. It may take him just a little bit of time, but when you pray about it, and, and if, if something is causing much trouble to you, to the church, to your community, God will take care of it. Uh, he does not, he loves his children, and he does not to wish them when they follow his advice, when they get along, if it's possible, if they do what is right, God will take care of the rest of it. That that you can't handle, he can change minds even. That you, can, you have got a prayer of a chance to change. He can change that mind. It's blessing to see him. Verse 20 to continue. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire <clears throat> on his head. Now, well, what am I going to feed him? The Word of God. That's what you're supposed to feed him. And uh, if he thirsts, what are you supposed to give him to drink? From that fountain of the living water, Christ. And, um, and in so doing, you heap coals of fire on his head. Why? Because God's a consuming fire. The real truth of God's word as it is needed. You can tell, you can discern, and when someone needs it, lay it on them. It's good for you to do that. It's good for you to serve God. Verse 21, to complete the chapter, be not overcome of evil. And make that an evil spirit. Don't let some evil spirit overcome you, but overcome evil with good. And, and so it is that our Father will always uh, bless you in that, how precious it is. Uh, always overcome that evil with, with good. It, it'll work. It'll happen. And our Father being in control. Now, uh, there you have the verses that pertain to getting along in society. That's to say with your neighbors, with the people. And it's very good advice. When you do that, in teaching and spreading the word, in sharing with the lambs and with the sheep, as accordingly as people need. That's what spiritual discernment is about. That's what God does for you. Now, for the government, chapter 13, verse 1, how do you get along with a government? Verse 1 reads, let every soul, that's every being, be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God allows wherever we are, whatever we are, we deserve it. Okay. If you trust God for his fairness, um, if we have sinned terribly as a nation, we're going to get bad rulers. You, you can count on it. That's, that's just the way it goes. Always has been from coming out the gate till right now. You are to always um, obey the government. You know, we, this, this fantastic government we have called the United States of America, many of us have fought on battlefields. Many of us have shed blood for the freedoms we have in this nation. You know, this, these freedoms of this nation give this chapel license to teach the Word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse and in our freedom of religion. And it carries all the way around the world. Our Father makes that possible because you obey the law as much as possible you obey that law. And, 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 and know that God, if there is some power in power, God has it there for a purpose. Observe it, learn from it, and correct it if it needs correcting. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. You, you go breaking the law, 
you'll lose your license or you'll, you will end up in, pro in problems. Um, this has to do, let's say, even with speed laws. If you speed, you're going to, sooner or later, the radar is going to uh, zap you and you're going to pay a heavy fine. So uh, you, you, it's, it's useless uh, to break laws. They're there for a purpose. It's to protect our young and, and so on and so forth. And, and in this great nation, we have a beautiful thing. We, we have this beautiful thing called a, of the, a government, a republic, of the people, by the people, and for the people. You see, there's no power comes into being that we didn't vote them there. And if we vote them there, they're your baby. How do you take care of it then? Well, you vote again. You vote them out. Okay. That's our choice. That's why this government is so precious. It is so good. You have a voice in that. Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works. As long as you're good, the rulers are not going to bother you. But to the evil, if you break the law, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power, that's to say the government? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. In other words, as long as you obey the law, they've got to protect you. They may not agree with what you say or what you do, but they have to protect you because you have that right in this great nation, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. You got a right to. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So that's up to you. Now, as long as you pay your taxes and stay in good standing in this government, it's got to take care of you. You're a citizen. And citizens uh, really run this nation. That's what a republic is, is ruled by the people, the citizens who have the right to vote, to, to control a situation by uh, picking their good leadership. So um, naturally, if you start breaking the laws of that nation, you're not going to be in good standing and you're going to end up in trouble. Verse 5, wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. In other words, you want, you want to do what's right with your own conscience. If you're going to please God, you've got to do what is right. Verse 6, for for this cause, pay ye tribute also. Pay your taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. In other words, um, uh, this is uh, you, you keeping everything in order. Uh, that is why we have taxes. We have to have, you know, if you didn't have taxes, we could not pay, let's say, our highway patrol. If we did not have our highway patrol, there would be fruitcakes out there destroying your children. They, they would be lawbreakers, but we have, through your taxes, we have uh, a, an army that protects this great nation, and it is ordained of God, and thank God for it. What, what a nation, and, and so it is. The, the taxes keep order, the, and when, especially if you have proper leaders. Well, what if we get some bad leaders? Vote them out. It's that simple. That's the beauty of this great nation. Verse, uh, and this, this Bible is telling you how to get it done, uh, uh, get along in a government in this chapter 13. Verse 7, render therefore to all their dues, Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, and fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Always honor those that deserve it. And um, naturally, if, if you have voted somebody in that's not doing right, what do you do? You get rid of them. 
It's that simple. It's a perfect order set up by God in his patience. Verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Uh, it is not good to borrow money from a friend. One way you can bust a friendship up is to borrow money from a friend, and if you are unable to pay it back, that friend is he's he's going to consider you. Well, let's face it. What if you could not pay it back? What would you be a failure? Okay, you haven't managed properly. So it, it is really better to not borrow money from a friend. It and. Um, we, uh, I can remember many years ago, well, uh, maybe I shouldn't, well, I will. I, there was a man here in the city of Gravit that, uh, and, and we had a fine little banker, and this, this man uh, plowed gardens, and that, that was his method of making a living, plowing gardens and doing yard work, and a person that owned a certain store asked this person one time, said, I, I, I would like to uh, borrow some money. And, and actually, he was teasing him. But this person very calmly said, you know, me and the banker down here have got an agreement. And our agreement is that I don't loan any money and he, does, he don't plow no gardens. Okay. So if you want to borrow money then go to a bank don't do it through a credit card if you've got good judgment you don't want to do that go to your local bank and and um, borrow do not borrow from a friend it's not good policy is many times a friend will help a friend and expect nothing in return that's a different situation that's but let the friend do it you don't ask and so forth verse 9 to continue for this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended, it's understood in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And that does kind of say it all. Now, this is one of the few places that you can really understand the word, thou shalt not kill. And, and I want you to do yourself a favor. Look the word kill up as it is used in, in this uh, 13th chapter and 9th verse of the great book of Romans. And you will find a Greek word used here, phonios, phonios, which means criminal homicide. It does not mean to be defending this nation and have to destroy an enemy, as Psalms 144 tells God give me strength to protect this nation to, to fight. Uh, this, this has to do with criminal homicide. It, that's what you're not supposed to do. And that's, that's as the commandment should be translated. And you shall do no murder, in other words. But uh, what, is it, what does all that mean? Obey the law, and you'll do just fine. Because any one of these you break, it's going to offend somebody. Anytime you start offending people, you're headed for trouble. Okay? Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. For love is the fulfilling of the law. There, there is nothing better than a good neighbor. A good neighbor, when you're away from your property, is a watchman. They're going to watch your property just as you watch theirs when they're gone. It's just a natural thing, usually, if you're in a good neighborhood and have a good neighbor. A good neighbor is a very uh, helpful uh, person to have around, and uh, so uh, very valuable, and it's wor well worth cultivating the friendship between neighborhoods uh, to to have that um, love, the Christian love going forth there. Okay, next verse, verse 11, and it reads, 
and that knowing the time that now it is nigh time to awake out of sleep and especially in this generation of the fig tree to know the time of the consummation of the end of this age and the events that transpire the time that christ returns the time that the antichrist returns you, you want to know those things for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe it gets closer every day we move toward that and it's what we're supposed to do is to to protect that and to be with it to to um, uh, be prepared to study the time to show yourself approved rightly dividing this word verse 12 to continue and verse 12 reads the night is far spent the day is at hand and you are a child of the day remember that let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light that is such good advice the darkness always applies to satan in his months moons and uh, all prophecies given concerning satan are given in moons months and all prophecies given for God's children are in days. What is the gospel armor? The main part, you can read all of them in Ephesians chapter 6, but the main part is your girt or your belt. It's the truth. It's the word of God. It holds your britches up. You'll never be embarrassed if you'll absorb the word of God. 13, let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering, that's, that's to say uh, arguing and fighting, and wantonness, jealousy, not in strife and envy. And that's not going to get you anywhere. One more verse to complete the chapter, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make, no, make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lust thereof. You let Christ, the Holy Spirit, be within you and control the flesh man and you'll always be blessed. This is, is a perfect teaching. The first nine verses of chapter 13 tell you how to get along yourself in your flesh body. And from verses 10 to 21 tells you how to get along in the community and with your neighbors and chapter 13, how to get along in the civil government and how to react to it. If you want God's blessing, how precious it is to serve him. You know, he doesn't leave us wanting. He gives us advice. And that advice is golden. It, all, it, 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 it makes you successful. It sets you apart from the ways of the world. And uh, the ways of the world is what you want to pull away from and put on Christ, all of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and live in, for, and by him. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada, up north. If you have a question, uh, share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We're not going to judge people. God judges the judging. You have the right to spiritually discern truth from fiction. And, and um, you, you know that you know. 
So let God always lead you in that. Now, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request. You do not need that number. Let's do away with it and the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. All you have to do is ask. I would advise that you let him know you love him. That's what he wants from you. Hosea 6.6, 6, don't want your burnt offerings. I want your grace, your mercy, your love. That makes his day, and when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. That's how you get along with him. Love is so important with him. That's why he created all things for his pleasure. You give him no pleasure, and you're in a heap of hurt. Let's go to his throne, Father. Around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, Lisa from Kentucky. Many teachers on Revelation 18 say that America is Babylon. Who is the end time Babylon? And do you have a tape on that uh, or address this? I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think, I think we have one on Mother Babylon or something of that nature. But Babylon, uh, actually you can read the last verse of Revelation chapter 17 and he tells you who that city is. It's those, what does Babel mean? Babel is confusion. And God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Therefore, all people that are deceived into riding that beast, which is the Antichrist that goes to him, is a part of Babel, and they join. They're, they're a member of it. Why? Because they're deceived. They don't know any better. And Babel simply means in confusion, and boy, are they confused. And there is nothing, if they don't choose to be helped, there's nothing you can do to help them. Not at this time. Millennium, a different story. Lee from California. Pastor, you had mentioned that the wild olive represents God's name. Can you please explain this to me? I could not find it in the Strong's Concordance. It's the word 1636, and it's an olive tree. It's an olive tree in the Greek. And, and the word you will find in the, uh, in the Greek concordance, 1636, is El. El is the title of God, and, um, and, and El, uh, Yah. And Yah, of course, is the sacred name. That's what Moses said, who am I, oh, you're sending me down there, who am I going to tell them sent me? He said, send them, tell them Yah sent you. So, Eliyah is the olive tree, and it is the oil from which we anoint people. It is not the oil that does the miracle divine healing, it is our obeyance in using it. That's why God chose it. Uh, Irene from Oregon, will you please explain who is the man named Thomas that some say is Jesus' twin? I cannot find anywhere in the Bible that says Jesus had a twin brother or that Mary ever... It's, it's that somebody's misleading you. Uh, Thomas' name is Didymus as well in the Greek tongue. Didymus means a twin. Thomas did have a twin, but it certainly wasn't Christ. The way you know better than that, if you stop and think a moment, who is Christ? He is the only begotten of God. So if he is the only begotten, there's no way he could ever have a twin or anything else. I don't know why it is, but it seems some people always want to put the flesh on the Savior. And it, 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 uh, he was in the flesh well enough. The flesh became the Word and walked among us. But Thomas ha did have a twin, and that's why his name is Didymus. Uh, and, uh, but it was not the Christ. Uh, Glenda from um, Nevada. I know the Bible states to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. However, in Psalm 6, 5, it says, For in death there is no remembrance of thee in the grave. Who shall give thee thanks? Well, what uh, goes in the grave? You, you're going to remember what, what, excuse me, what God teaches us. 
What goes into the grave? The flesh body does. Now, when you read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6, where does your soul go? Your spiritual body. And you read, and I repeat this quite often, it returns to the Father from whence it came. So certainly the flesh, certainly it goes back to dirt. And it's never remembered again. It's never going to come out of that ground. There was only one instant where it appeared people came out of the grave. It was so that Christ, when he resurrected, could, could show people in Jerusalem he had defeated death because it was their spiritual bodies walking around, not their flesh bodies. Okay. Um, I, I would highly recommend, um, Glenda, that you read Ecclesiastes chapter 9. It lets you know what happens to the flesh body. Uh, okay, Lori from Arizona. I am hearing God has a plan for your life, but what if you feel you messed up that plan? I feel I've made mistakes because after finally getting a job, after being unemployed for three years, I quit because I realized it just wasn't right for me. I can't get over the disappointment I feel with myself. I feel I've disappointed God by not taking the job and I finally got. Is that like a slap in the face to him? Well, it, it possibly, I, I have no idea why you felt you had to leave that job or was someone bothering you or you, you being insulted. Uh, you know, there are some things that are not worth putting up with, but if it was just because you simply didn't want to work, that's a different story. Sometimes when jobs are scarce, we have to take whatever we can get to sustain ourselves. That's, that's no biggie. You know, uh, it, um, if God blesses you with a job, then for at least for a time until something better comes along. Um, I, I have a saying in, in counseling, uh, never burn a bridge behind you until you get all the way across, and you'll have a lot better life. Uh, Joanne from Massachusetts, what will happen to the people who get fooled into worshiping the Antichrist when they have been taught wrong? Will they be damned or will they be taught the, the truth in the millennium? Well, how do you think Christ would feel about it? They're whoring around and worshiping Satan. After he sent them the book, to study for themselves. It's a letter written to us personally. I know he sends teachers, but anyway, this is why God in all his love has the millennium. It is to take care of those, but they certainly will not take part in the first resurrection. Maybe, just maybe, because God the elect will teach with Christ through the millennium a thousand years, then maybe they will take part in the second resurrection, which is when Satan is released a while. If they still want to honey up to him, they've had it. They're going to hell. But if they stay with Christ after being taught properly, they will know the truth. If they still choose him, they're out of here. They're gone, and they should be. Thomas from Arizona. Was Satan the father of Cain? Well, that's, that's what Jesus taught. Jesus said in, in um, Matthew chapter 13 uh, concerning the tares, which, which are the Kenites, he said, a wicked one came along in the night. This would be about verse 35, 36, 37, 38. Came along in the night and planted the wicked children. And then Christ himself in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, said, Cain, the first murderer. Well, now, who was the first murderer? Well, it was Cain, of course. He said, the reason you don't listen to me is because you are of your father the devil, and the deeds of your father you'll do. And so it is. Kenite simply means children of Cain. It's a Hebrew word. You'll find it many times in the good old King James. Daniel from Arizona. Can a Christian lose their salvation? Their salvation is always there because Christ is the Savior. If they will repent and straighten themselves out. If they do not repent, they're going to hell. 
and uh, and so it is. It seems like it's difficult for some people to understand that, but it's common sense. If Christ saves you and you keep breaking every law in the book and expect him to have you, you're fooling yourself. You're not going to do it. So once you repent and, and, uh, and have that erased from the book of life, which you're judged out of, then you'll be just fine. But if, if you continue after salvation until you grow so far across from, away from the cross that you can go to hell, you betcha. Melba from North Carolina. Pastor Murray, is it wrong to hate someone who treats you wrong? Well, um, I wouldn't spend too much time hating them. I would put some distance. I, I, I know not. A wise person can never give advice when you don't have the fact. Who are we talking about? Is it a mate? That would fall under a whole different set of rules. Is it a neighbor? Well, today's lecture kind of helped you on that. Hey, if it's possible, get along. And if it's not, put some distance in there. You don't, you know, life is too short to be around somebody that hates you. And um, unless God intends you to straighten them out, but I would, if it is a relative, then I would advise that you read Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse six, all the way to the end of the of the chapter, and it will help you. But God's being a, a child of God; He doesn't expect us to be stomped on. We're not second-class citizens. We're first-class citizens. We don't take anything off anybody. We will pray for somebody. We will try to help somebody, but we will not be abused. Uh, Father knows his name from California. I was baptized at 11 years old. I would like to give my life to the Lord. Do I need to get baptized again? If you knew you were being baptized of the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't, it, it, that baptism is between you and him. And you don't need to be rebaptized again. If you knew what you were doing, then you and and at the age of eleven, you're at the age of accountability. So you do not need to be baptized again. If you feel you must, then you have a conviction, and that makes it a different story. But <clears throat> by God's law, you don't have to. Let him know you love him. Pat from Florida. My 19-year-old son passed away 11 years ago, and some of that time is pretty foggy now. But because of that, God put the, his hand on me and drew me in at that time. I'm sure I found passage referring to God taking a good person because times ahead would be too great to bear. Can you tell me where this is at, in the Bible? It would be the way... It could be the way it is translated, but I can't find it. Now, you've been a blessing ever since. Well, thank you. It's uh, Our Father's good to us. Uh, our, I, I do believe that there are some children that are just too good for this world, and God calls them home. Be that as it may, that's, he's the judge, and he does that, and we, we don't know. Now, we know that God is putting an army together in heaven that he's bringing back with him also, as well as he's putting one together here uh, to consummate the end of this age. So there's one thing for certain. You know from Luke chapter 16 that God loves the good ones enough that they're on the right side of that gulf, and they're with um, Abraham and Isaac, and how fantastic that must be, with Christ himself. Okay, Pat from Florida. Who is coming in the time of the locust? Our seasons are not the same as all countries. So in our, so is our summer months. It may be winter months in other countries or vice versa. Are we basically in the same season as Israel? Basically, in other words, the five month period of the locust happens to fall between Passover and the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, that five month period, within that five month period right there. <clears throat> so certainly uh, it pretty well holds true in the parallel in which we are. Uh, Pastor Murray, Yvonne from Michigan, please tell me the verse that says our souls go to heaven when our earthly body gives out. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. 
please tell me the verse that says God, God's elect, God elected 100 and, 144,000 will go to heaven. Uh, well, that's, there's, uh, that's not true. God chooses in Revelation chapter 7 144,000 that were even deceived for a while. But if somebody's trying to tell you that only 144,000 go to heaven, then you need in that same seventh chapter that the 144,000 are, are called by tribe, read the ninth verse. And what, what does the ninth verse of chapter 7 in the book of Revelation say? It says that while he's choosing these uh, 144,000, there are already a number of people that have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, meaning Christ's blood, accepting him in heaven, that you can't even count them. So somebody's blowing smoke, all right? That's, that's all I can say about it. Um, Cornelia from Virginia. I'm 81 years old and, and uh, watch you every day. Thank you. I have a question. In Isaiah, does he, his writings talk about the new earth and the old both? I have the feeling he is trying to tell us something about both. Well, he does. Isaiah chapter 11 tells us of heaven to be. It's a way future. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 tells us about the first creation. When God created this earth, he created it in this age to be inhabited. And, and so it is. As Isaiah is a fantastic book. Uh, Diane from Tennessee. I have a question or two about the first Samuel 28, 16. Samuel is brought up by a woman who is able to call up spirits. How was this possible if it, to be absent from the body is pre well, she, she was um, the witch of Endor. And um, witches can call up evil spirits that can appear to be someone else, okay? And, and so it is. Uh, if God would choose for the real person to, for, to teach Saul a lesson, he could have done that also. Geraldine from California, Pastor, is the locust army Kenites or Muslims? Well, it, it says in Revelation chapter 9 that that whole army wears crowns. Only that word in, in the um, manuscripts is, um, is turban. A Taliban, turban, which means it's wraparound. They, have, they all wear wraparounds around their head. So naturally, that would be the Muslim world. But, um, uh, and, and certainly uh, the Kenites, basically, they are also controlling. So you have to, you have to understand uh, Satan's pretty wise, and you're supposed to be wiser than he is. Um, also, some are saying the locust army appears when Satan opens the abyss. Um, <clears throat> the locust army appears at the uh, sixth trump, and it's going to happen. Uh, Eldon from Minnesota, please clarify for me uh, and many others how Eve could become pregnant by a snake. Um, no one believes me describing Adam's genealogy. Well, if you're telling them he was pregnant by a snake, I can understand why, okay? Because you, you must realize the Bible has a great deal of symbology. It has a lot of analogies. But also, certain people have certain names. I, I want you to read either in Revelation chapter 20, the first three verses, or I want you to read three verses after Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. It gives you every name of Satan. The serpent is one of Satan's names. It was Satan himself in person, that uh, cherubim. And um, that was uh, what happened there. You can read of it. Jesus tells you quite plainly in Matthew 13, 35 forward, hidden from before the foundation of the world. 
<clears throat> the parable of the tares. That's what it means. Uh, Tim from Iowa, my question is, I know the Antichrist comes first, and God comes to earth on the seventh trump. Will this happen all at once, or will there be a phase in between? Thank you. There'll be a five-month phase in between. Why? Well, God is good to us. He lets us know in Revelation chapter 9 that that is the seal of truth, that Satan will have the five-month period, and it will be that sage, siege, uh, sage uh, that part of the locust life, that five-month period from May through September. And um, he, he pretty well lets us know. But then he gives you their leader's name in two languages, Greek and Hebrew, so that you can't go wrong. It's Satan. Uh, Whitney or Whitney from Arkansas. Um, my name is Whitney. I'm nine years old. My, co my cousin, uh, my question is, did God make the bad animal, angels rather, uh, and bad so we can choose who we want to follow. You, you pretty well got it right. Uh, uh, they, they became bad themselves. God didn't make them that way, and he wants to know how you make your mind up. Good to hear from you. I'm out of time. Love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. So let him know you love him. It does make his day. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. You can count on that. Most important, though, you listen to me. Listen good. Now, you stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, my little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments, after these words of encouragement. John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the Epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. A day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. You know what we're going to do today? We're going to do why worry. Uh, you know, a lot of people go off on tangents and they forget the promises of God. Get all uptight, come unstrung, just lose it all. There's no need in that. You have a Christian has every right in the world to be secure, be on the ball.